out whether you noticed or not, but you see, the more you expose yourself to this kind of stuff you're going through this week, uh, the better condition you get in spiritually. Amen. And some of you feel pretty exhausted right now and pretty tired, but that's good. That means you've been beaten nearly to death, see? <laughs> and you notice the more you get, the more quiet, that, that peace I've been looking for, see? You begin to get it. But you have to have the devil preached out of your verse. <laughs> All right, let's have some questions. Yes, sir. First Corinthians thirteen ten. Now the standard way to teach the passage is this. The standard way to teach it is that uh, when the New Testament is complete, then the things that are partial will be done away with. And it's the proof text that Baptists use to prove that tongues are done away with the completion of the New Testament. And the Baptists get hard pressed to prove what happened to tongues. So they read verse eight: Charity never faileth, but whether it be prophecy, they shall fail; whether it be tongue, they shall cease. When do they cease? Well, the Baptist will read verse 10, when that which is perfect has come, the Bible, the New Testament, the that which is in part, verse 8, the tongues, shall be done away. So it's a proof text to prove when the Bible is complete, there'll be no more tongues. But it won't work. Because 8 says, charity never fails, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Prophecies don't fail with the completion of the New Testament. Whether it be tongue, they shall cease. Whether it be knowledge, it shall vanish away. Well, well, knowledge doesn't vanish away at the completion of the New Testament. Somebody's reading something in there that isn't there. That isn't all. Verse 11, when I was a child, I spake as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now, before that which is perfect has come, now we see through a glass darkly, but then, when that which is perfect has come, face to face. Now, before that which is perfect has come, I know in part, but then, well, that, you see, when these fellows teach this verse, they pretend verse 12 is not in the passage, but verse 12 is in the passage. All right, the answer to that thing is plain from verse 12. Now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. All right, if there's one thing face to face means, it never means what anything is written. How do you know that? Turn to the first epistle of John, or rather second epistle. John makes it clear twice that when you see face to face, it could have nothing to do with anything anybody wrote. Second John, Second John, verse twelve. Second Epistle in the back of your Bible over near Revelation. Second John twelve. And if there be many things to write to you, I would not write with I would not write with paper and ink, but I trust to come to you and speak face to face. One more time, third John thirteen. 3 John 13, I had many things to write, but I will not with ink and pen write to thee, but I trust I shall see thee, we shall speak face to face. That whoever thinks that face to face means when the Bible is completed is off their rocker. You say, who would that be? That would be 95% of all the faculties of every seminary in the world. You say, why well, do they have so many problems? I don't know why it is. I think maybe a study of Greek and Hebrew hinders the knowledge of the Word of God. Sometimes I think it's that. Uh, the requisite for learning the Word of God has nothing to do with Hebrew or Greek. I can tell you two things you need to go learn that word with, and neither one of them has anything to do with education. The first is a, is a humble mind, and the second is a believing heart. And if you have a humble mind, a believing heart, you can learn that book. And if you don't have those two, whatever else you got, you never learn anyway. You're just wasting your time for it. All right, now about this thing, what does it mean? Go back to 1 Corinthians 13, verse 10. When that which is perfect is come. All right, Scripture, Scripture, 1 John 1. 1 John 1. There isn't a doubt about it all what it's a reference to. 1 John 1. 1 John 1, 1. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled, of the word of life. It's a reference to Jesus Christ. Three, that which we have seen. One, that which, it's a reference to Jesus Christ. That which is perfect has come is a reference to the second advent of Christ. Now, how do you know that? 
Back to 1 Corinthians 13. Let's get it again. 1 Corinthians 13, 10. When that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away with. Away with. Knowledge in parts done away with. Prophecy is in part done away with. Everything is full. So prophecies, tongues, and knowledge all fail the second advent because they're only in part. When that which is perfect is come, that which is in part shall be done away with. You'll have perfect knowledge and prophecy will be fulfilled. Verse 12, and here's the final proof. For now we see through a glass darkly. Uh, James refers to somebody looking into the Bible like somebody looking into a, into a mirror. But then when Christ comes face to face, now here's the proof. Now I know in part. My knowledge is partial. But then, when, face to face, I shall know, active verb, even as I am known, passive verb, when Christ comes, you'll know as much then as he knows about you right now. You do not know as much right now as the Lord knows about you. No matter how much whether this was completed or not, you won't know that the Lord comes back. Oh, right, now the problem comes up, well, if that's true, then we don't have any proof text to prove that tongues should vanish. You see, you see what everybody does, most everybody. They find a truth, and once they get a truth, they try to make the whole Bible teach that truth. And when you try to make the whole Bible teach that truth, you pervert the Bible, because the, whole, the, whole, the Bible may not teach that truth, the whole Bible. For example, suppose I'm a Campbellite. I get us to Church of Christ, you know what that is. We call them water dogs down south. We say, of oh, those born water, three are born outright, a tadpole, a mosquito, and a Campbellite. <laughs> And what you do is get up there and you say, Repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, mission of the same use as you get the Holy Ghost. Uh, we quote a verse that says you've got to be baptized in water to get the Holy Ghost. Then we go through the Bible and try to prove that every time it says baptism, it's talking about water baptism. But it's not. Suppose I'm a hard shell Baptist. That's a primitive Baptist, a five point Calvinist, Tulip. I get up and I say this. I say, What is to be shall be, you know. So I try to make the whole Bible teach predestination. The whole Bible will not teach predestination. Predestination is found in two paths in the Bible, and neither one time does it refer to an unsaved man, a saved man. The thing is to be shall be. Not necessarily. Not necessarily. I'll give you a good one. David's praying, Lord, if I go down there to Halkala, will the Ziphites deliver me into Saul's hand? And the Lord says, they will deliver you into his hand. They didn't. But the Lord do lie. The Lord said they'd deliver you. But they didn't. You say, why not? Because David didn't go down. <laughs> See? You say, what happened if he'd gone down? They'd have got him. You know what God did? He took predestination condition on what the guy wanted to do. The Lord had either of them fixed out. They're both fixed. If you go down, that'll happen. If you don't go down, that'll happen. You trust Christ, you go there. You don't trust Christ, you go there. Amen. Who's the final authority on that? You. Amen. Boy, tell that to Calvin and watch him do a break dance in his grave. <laughs> All right, now. This thing about tongues, what Baptists, they're so anxious to get rid of the tongues, they take that verse to prove the tongues are done away with. It won't work. There's a much simpler way to handle it. A much more scriptural way. 1 Corinthians 14, 1 Corinthians 14, 22. There's a much better way to handle it. Some of the brethren got so worried about haircuts about two years ago, they started cutting Christ's hair. I remember Brother Hiles had a tract on it, and the fellow led me to Christ, Hugh Pyle, he had a tract on it, and they showed Christ with his hair all bobbed up, so it'll pass the standard. That's the wrong thing to do. If Christ cut his hair, he broke the law. Leviticus 19 says that Jew has to have long hair. Some as well, uh, love. doesn't nature teach you for man to shame have man have long hair? Yeah. Mm. You say, wasn't a shame for Christ to have long hair? Oh, uh, yes, sure was. Matter of fact, a Jew had to do two things contrary to nature to be a peculiar people. He had to let his hair grow and he had to be circumcised. That both contrary to nature. But you see, you're so anxious to get your kid to clean up and cut the hair right that you'll change the Bible in order to reinforce something you know so. Now, I know it's so a shame for a man to have long hair. You don't see me come here, you know, covered up like a yak or something. I mean, I believe that. I believe the guy should be five foot two in his hair, six feet four. <laughs> but, 
But you can't pervert the Bible and make it teach what you know is so. Don't you see if you do that, you've lost your authority for truth? If you change the book to enforce what you believe, then you've, you've, you've made yourself the judge of the book instead of the book you're a judge. So what they do is try to put this stuff in. Now, there's a much better way to handle it. 1 Corinthians 14, 22. Wherefore, tongues are for what? Sign. What? Sign. Okay. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 22. 1 Corinthians 1, 22. You're told what tongues are. They're a sign. 1 Corinthians 1, 22. For the Jews require what? Sign. One more time. Require what? Sign. Then tongues are a sign for the Jew. How do you know? You just read it. All right, now come to 1 Corinthians 12. Now we've got something to work with. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 7. The word charisma, charisma, means gifted. A charismatic is supposed to be a man who has a gift that you don't have. If they say a politician has a gifted man, they see as charisma. So you might know they'd pull a Greek word on you. All right, 1 Corinthians 12, 7. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man, to profit with all. For the one is given by the Spirit, the word of wisdom, not a sign. To another, the word of knowledge, not a sign. To another, faith. See, the gifts are still here. The gifts are still in the church. But not the sign gifts. Keep on reading. Not the gifts of healing, but the same Spirit. That's a sign. How you know it's a sign? Mark 16. These signs shall follow them that believe. They'll lay hand the sick, they shall recover. Is that thing? Verse 10, another working of miracles, it's a sign. Another prophecy, that's not a sign. Another discerning of spirits, not a sign. Another diverse kind of tongues, a sign. Interpretation of tongues, sign. The sign gifts are for Israel. The rest of them are still in effect. How do you know that? Turn to Acts chapter 28, Scripture with Scripture. Martin used to say, Sola Scriptura, Scripture alone. Acts 28, verse 28. At the end of the book of Acts, the sign gifts are going. Going, going, gone. Acts one twenty eight. Be it known therefore to you that the salvation of God is sent to the Gentiles, and they will hear. And the Jews departed. Now do you know how you know that interpretation is correct? Because when Paul gets to the end of his ministry, he's recommending doctors instead of laying his hand on them. You know what Paul says after the book of Acts is over? He says, I have left Trophimus at Miletum sick. You know what Paul says after the book of Acts over? Drink a little wine for thy stomach's sake and thy often infirmities. Recommending medicine, which means the sign gifts are gone. So the answer to your question is that which is perfect has come as a reference to the advent of Jesus Christ. Yes, sir. The back. Dr. Ruckman, Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4, 2, that he's renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, and not handling the Word of God deceitfully. Yet just a few chapters over in chapter 12, verse 16, he says, uh, being crafty, I caught you with guile. Uh -huh. Can you reconcile those two verses for All us? right. Uh, the answer to this thing is that Paul's a, he's a character, which you might know, and sometimes Paul is real sarcastic real sarcastic and nowhere in the Bible does the sarcasm show any better than in 2 Corinthians 2 Corinthians is about the ministry we talk about the ministry we always teach the book of Acts for the ministry but that isn't the minister's handbook the minister's handbook is 2 Corinthians as a matter of fact the whole epistle is in the ministry the fellow wants to know what the ministry is it's 2 Corinthians All right, here's the first one 2 Corinthians 4.1 Therefore, see, we have this ministry. That's what the whole book is about. As we have received mercy, we faint not. We have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, that nothing done in the dark. Not walking in craftiness. It's plain spoken, outspoken. Not trying to trick you. I mentioned that over there in Corinthians. Not with a, a wisdom of man speech and all that kind of business and good words and fair speeches. You never have to worry, really, about anybody like uh, Modlish, or uh, Lackey, or Oliver Green, or Mays Jackson, or Billy Kelly, or Ruckman. You never have to worry about them. Because we talk so plain that if somebody doesn't like us, they'll have enough alibi to cut our throat by the time we talk five minutes, so there's no, no problem getting in. 
we're not, we are not uh, wolves in sheep's clothing. We are sheep in wolves' clothing. <laughs> we scare people. We scare the saints. But you never, that ain't the fellow you have to look out for. The guy you've got to look out for is the fellow that says, Dearly beloved of God, we are gathered here once again to share with you the beautiful thoughts of positive thinking people who are not judgmental in their that's the bird you gotta look out for. Amen. That thing is a raven and wolf slobbering saliva at the jaws, boy. But you take American, American Christian, that is like dogs. Now I don't know horses. Think about horse. I don't want to know about horse. I don't want to think I want to know about a horse, which way can I run? That's all I know. But dogs, I know dogs. I got a German shepherd home, but suppose he came to the door. And I said, uh, Come on there, you sorry good for nothing thing. I'm going to take you out of the backyard and blow your brains out with the 22. <laughs> he just smiled and wagged his tail, you know. And if he came to the door and I said, Good dog, good dog, good dog, he'd get out and cow down and stick his tail between his legs. See, he don't hear a word I'm saying. So like he's listening, but he ain't hearing. <laughs> you know what he's doing? He listens to the tone of my voice. Well, that's where American Christians are. They've gotten a place where one politician can get more out of them than a Bible-believing preacher because they're listening to his voice. And if the voice is smooth and well-modulated, you know, like Garner Ted Armstrong, or soft and kind like Robert Schuller, or cultured, educated like MacArthur, they think he loves them. You know why? Because they're stupid. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Who demonstrates more love than anybody? Why, you know who demonstrates more love than anybody? Politicians. That smile, that handshake, everybody they see, boy. Does that mean they love you? They're after your pocketbook. See, don't worry about us. Now, our, our approach is, there it is, blam! Take it or leave it. <laughs> and uh, I've been that way ever since I was saved. Uh, I'll tell you why. I was raised Episcopalian. And you wouldn't guess that to look at me, but I was raised in high church, Anglican church. And they had the biggest choir, you know, singing. Uh, the guy, the fellow would come up and he'd say, The Lord is in his holy temple and all the earth keeps silence before him. You know. And the choir would sing, Amen, Amen, Amen. Amen, 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 Amen. I'm sitting there saying, ah, oh, rats. <laughs> I'm, about, I'm about 10 years old, and I've seen as many movies you've seen now. <laughs> and I was about 10 years old. I'd just been seeing Tarzana gangbusters or something, and I'm sitting there in that big, cool, dark, vaulted cathedral, you know. It's like a morgue, man. And this preacher's voice is droning in my ears. Ah, we have done those things which we ought to have done. We have done not those things which we ought not to have done. There is no help upon us we got, you know. I'm sitting there looking up the rafters, you know, I see Tarzan come across there. Oh, you'll swing across it with a vine. And then somebody come in and rob the collection plate, and I trip and going out and get the medal for capturing the robbery, you know, that kind of stuff. Oh, yeah, man. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I haven't changed any, you know. I was a peculiar kid even those days. I'd go to a horror movie and cheer for the monster, you know, that's kind of what I was. And uh, so I'd sit there like that, and then pretty soon the third would be over, and I, I never forget the first time I heard that guy at the door. And I thought when I got the door, that rector, that's what they call him, a rector. They're, they're a wreck, too. And the first time I heard the door, I thought he'd say, Good morning, Mrs. Jones. How are you, Brother Jones? So glad to have you here today. That's what he's doing up in the pulpit. I'm just like a Catholic priest. I don't want to speak five, four, four, me, purpose, you know, hey, Mary, full of grapes, but the fruit of the loom and all that stuff. Well, they just they memorize that junk. Oh, yeah, they memorize that. And I thought he'd say, I thought he said, good morning, but when we got the door, hello, Mr. Smith, so glad to have you out. Yes, I'm the children wonderful. Well, how's your wife doing? I never did get over that. Not just a kid. I saw the thing and I said, well, oh, is this a different guy that came down here and the one was up there? <laughs> and when I got saved and called to preach, that's the first thing I remembered. And I said, well, Peter S., old boy, you're not going to talk any different up there than you do down there. You're going to talk about it on a fishing boat. You're going to talk about it on the beach or any place you go than you do in the pulpit. You talk plain. They understand it. If they don't like it, lump it. I mean, I've had enough dealing with human nature. I've observed some things. When a man wants the truth, he'll take it no matter how you give it to him. If a man is hungry for the truth, he'll take it. 
I don't care if you give it to him with a jackhammer, laser beam, and a, a sledgehammer, and vinegar, and pepper, and stew down to a fine poison, he'll take it. And if a guy doesn't want the truth, he won't take it no matter how it's dished out. So I just don't take any care how I dish it out. I just say, whoop, there it is. You want it? Get it. <laughs> Two, nor handing the word of God deceitfully like the brethren do. Handing the word of God trickily, praying tricks to the word of God. But by manifestation of the truth, commanding ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. That is, actions above board, nothing on the table, nothing hid. Now here's the contradiction. Second Corinthians 12. Uh, 2 Corinthians 12, verse 16. A confession here. A confession here, 2 Corinthians 12. 2 Corinthians 12, verse uh, 16. Be it, be it so, I did not burden you. Nevertheless, being crafty, I caught you with guile. <laughs> He tricked him into it. <laughs> well, see, over there, back in the other place, he just he just said he didn't do that. He said he dealt with folks honestly and openly, didn't handle it deceitfully. Here he said, I was crafty, and I caught you with guile. Well, that's uh, Paul using a little sarcasm. And he'll do that uh, a lot. Uh, in this epistle, he'll do it a lot. Uh, I haven't got it marked here. Somebody find me the uh, place in, the, in this epistle where he says... Uh, or is it in First Corinthians, where he says, I robbed other churches to minister to you? Where's that? First Corinthians 9, or is that over here? 11, 8. There you go. 11, 8. I robbed other churches. Why, well, he didn't do that. Paul wasn't a church robber. He didn't go around holding up churches. I robbed other churches, taking wage of them to do you service. And then he says, uh, oh, in the passage 7, Have I committed an offense in abasing myself? You might be exalted because I have preached you the gospel of God freely. It's sarcasm. Let me show another place just like it. Verse uh, 4. For if he that cometh preaches another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or you receive another spirit which you have not received, or another gospel which you have not accepted, you might well bear with him. You can put up with him. That isn't what he said in Galatians. Galatians said, if any man preach in the gospel, let God curse him. That you might put up. You see, he's, Paul gets very sarcastic at times. You know what he said in 1 Corinthians? He said, you have reigned without us, as king without us. He did, they weren't reigning. There's no reign until Christ comes back. So he goes on and says, I would to God you did reign. See, he's using sarcasm. So Paul, just a plain speaker, and sometimes he uses strong terms like we use strong terms, and if you think it's wrong, then you ought to study your Bible and you'll find the Lord is the same way. Amen. The Lord's a character. Amen. The Lord says, and now we call the, the wicked happy. We. The Lord, you know, puts himself in with the people saying that. And now we call the Lord the wicked happy. And everybody the tent God is set up. We. <laughs> a sarcasm. Lord has a he has a vicious sense of humor. It's a, it's a GI sense of humor. I'll give you a good example. Don't you know Harry was offended in that saying, "Go tell that old fox." Well, now you know Jesus didn't think Harry was a four-legged fox. Here's a good one. Don't you know the Pharisees were offended? Leave him alone. If the blind lead the blind, they both fall in a ditch. That's almost a cruel joke, isn't it? Think of think about that. Can't you see a bunch of blind men fall, a blind man fall off on the highway and get run over? What a thing to say, man. But the Lord is like that. I'll give you another one. Amos chapter 4, verse 4. Come to Bethel and transgress. <laughs> That's a commandment. You know what Bethel means? It's the house of God. You know what the Lord told them? Come to the house of God and transgress. The Lord rough sometimes. Now that's sarcasm. And when Paul talking about that thing right there, in the passage there, look at the context of that thing. 1 Corinthians twelve fifteen, I will be very gladly spend, spend, give up, and be spent for you. You'll wear out trying to help them out. Though the more abundantly I love you, the less I be loved. Be it so, whether you love me or not. I did not burden you with the offering. You got the offering someplace else. Nevertheless, being crafty, I caught you with guile. He got their confidence by helping them out. By helping them out. But it's not guile like trickery. That's sarcasm. He could have just well have said, nevertheless, being wise, I use something to get your attention. But he's just a little sarcastic about it. 
follow that way. Yes, sir. Could you explain the difference between the local church and the body of Christ and this universal church? All right. Get Ephesians chapter 5 in one hand and get uh, Acts chapter 16 in the other. Ephesians chapter 5 and Acts chapter 16. Ephesians 5 and Acts 16. Now, the problem here is, what is the church? And the answer is, there is a church in the Bible that is an organization, and it's a divine institution, and there's a church in the Bible that's an organism, and it's a body, and the two are not identical. Now, the problem comes in the book of Acts, because in the book of Acts, that's where everybody gets the Acts anyway, you get the book of Acts, and in Acts chapter 1 and 2, the body is the local church. But then after that, things go to pieces. Now, let me show you the kind of problem you're up against. I suppose I'm Paul, and I write a letter, and I say to the church in Seattle, Greeting is my Lord Jesus Christ. Who gets the letter? What church? See, problem? <laughs> uh, the Catholic church said it's us. Thou Peter and upon the rock I'll build my church. It's us. And the Protestant, oh, no, man, you're not scriptural. It's us. And the Baptists are, wait a minute, you Protestants are apostate, modern liberals, the Baptist church. Yeah? Which Baptist church? Yeah. <laughs> Grand Association of Regular Baptists? Northern Baptists? Southern Baptists? Conservative Baptists? World Baptists? Bible Baptists? Two Seed and One Baptists? Primitive Baptists? Hardshell Baptists? Missionary Baptists? Baptist Baptists? <laughs> Who gets the letter? You see, in Acts chapter 1 and 2, all the saved people that are in the local church are all in one place. You get stuff to the church at Ephesus, the church at Colossia, all the Christians are meeting in one place. Now they meet in hundreds of places. All right, Romans chapter 16. Now this first one is a local church. Romans 16, 16. Salute one another with a holy kiss. The church is. You see the plural? Romans 16, 16. You see the plural? Romans sixteen sixteen. The church is. You see the plural? The body of Christ is never spoken of in the plural. Not one time. Those are plural churches. Let's see about those churches. Uh, verse 5. Likewise greet the church that is in their house. See that? That's a local church meeting in a home. Do you ever stop thinking of the mess God's people get into sometimes? The Campbellites, they say, we speak what the Scriptures speak, we're silent what the Scriptures are silent. Of course, that's a lie, but it'd be nice to do if you could do it that way, but you can't do it that way. We had a guy come to our church one time, he was a great one for Scripture, and he said, the church has no business meeting in this building, they should meet in the house, because the early Christians met in the homes. What Scripture can you find for a church building? Answer, there isn't any. You can't find a verse scripture anywhere in the New Testament for church building. What are you going to do? Get rid of everything you've got because you can't find a verse for it? Do you know something? You can get so scriptural, you're unscriptural. Do you know that? We had a guy in our church one time said, what's the altar for? There's no altar in the New Testament. What's the pulpit for? There's no pulpit in the New Testament. What's the choir for? There's no choir in the New Testament. Well, there's no Sunday school in the New Testament. What are you going to do? Just disband? Forget it? I said, I thought, I said, do you have to have a chapter and verse for everything? He said, yes. I said, where's your chapter and verse for that car you're driving? Amen. How come you're not driving a camel or a horse? Amen. You can't find a scripture for, what are you going to do a scripture for a light bulb? How about the commodes? <laughs> See how people are? I think, well, they're going to have a verse of scripture for everything. Now, here's, here's what you want to get. As long as a thing is not against the scripture, it's permissible. For example, you going to start a Christian school? I defy you to find a school anywhere in that New Testament. It isn't there. So when you build a church building, you have to be careful. Why? It isn't in the New Testament. When you put up a school, you have to be careful. Why? It isn't in the New Testament. That doesn't mean that it's unscriptural. That just means there are some cases that aren't covered, and when you do a thing, make sure you don't contradict this when you do it. Now, that's the principle you've got to go by. Any other principle is madness. Now, let me show you what I mean. Let's get rid of this church building. It costs too much money to maintain. Amen. And meet in the home. <laughs> All right, now let me ask you something. Who would like to take care of this church this Sunday morning at your house? 
Do we have any volunteers? Any ladies like to have the nursery? How many how many kids you got in the nursery, Brother Blue? Forty. Any of you ladies like to take care of forty babies next Sunday? You gonna find parking place? You know in California they got laws now you can't even have Bible study at your home if you've got six, seven cars parked out in front of your house? What's gonna do with a hundred cars parked out in front of your house? See, just because you can't find a verse for it, that doesn't mean it isn't right, and that doesn't mean God doesn't want you to do it. You gotta be you gotta use your head about those things. All right, now here's local assembly, church heirs. Are the local churches, is the local church as an organization, is it a mystery? No, it's not a mystery. Turn to Ephesians 5. Ephesians 5. Ephesians 5, verse 23. Ephesians 5, 23. The husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ, the head of the, of the church, singular, and of the Savior of the body. Therefore is the church, singular, is subject to Christ, so that the wife be to their own husbands and everything. Verse 32. 32. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Then the church is a great mystery. Are local churches great mysteries? Why, of course not. There were local churches in the Old Testament. Turn to Acts 7. There's nothing mysterious about a local church. A local church is a call-out assembly. Acts 7, 38. There were many churches before Christ showed up. What we're interested in here is his local assembly that he called out. Or right, Acts chapter 7, Acts chapter 7, verse 38. This is he that was in the church in the wilderness with the angel which spake to them in Mount Sinai. Israel in the wilderness is a church. It's a local call-out assembly. If, you, if a fellow is going to be a pastor, one of the greatest studies he can study is Exodus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. I think that's the greatest, just about the greatest book in the Bible for a pastor. Paul's ministry in Corinthians all phased the ministry, including evangelism, missionary work. But a pastor's job is what Moses had. Moses called a shepherd in Isaiah. You know what that bird did? He took two million members out of the convention. <laughs> did you ever take a Did you ever take a church out of the convention? You talk about a hell breaking loose man. But that guy did, he took two million members out of there and then had rebels among the book, people complaining about his wife, people complaining about his right-hand man, Aaron, up in the mountain, a posse breaks loose when he took an evangelistic tour, you know, and came back, dancing around a golden calf. You want to see a study, boy, of a, of a local church and a pastor, that's it. And sometimes an old boy's flat in his face, ready to quit. I mean, if I won't forgive him, then block me out of your book that you've written. Every time you find Moses, he's flat in his face, flat in his face. That's a picture of the ministry. Oh, and that's a local church called out, and local churches, plural, are local assemblies set up. Oh, I turn to Matthew chapter 10. The New Testament local assembly is called out before Pentecost. Matthew chapter 10. And when these disciples are called out, they constitute a local church, which Christ said he'd found, and that local church is a local called out assembly. Matthew 10, 1. And when he had called to him his twelve disciples, he gave them power against unclean spirits, so forth and so on. Now that's obviously a local assembly, because a little bit later he says, if you have any trouble there with your brethren, then tell it to the church. And obviously he's talking about a local call-out assembly. Now here comes the first problem. Verse 4. Simon the Canaanite and Judas Iscariot, who also betrayed him, is Judas in the body of Christ? How many of you say yes? How many say no? Okay. Was he in the local church? How many say yes? All right. The local church, not the body of Christ. But no way in God's earth. In the local church, you have unsaved people. There are no unsaved people in the body of Christ. You enter, you enter, you enter the body of Christ by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit puts you into Christ. You become part of His body. Now, when we say universal church, and I don't use that term, it's not a Bible term, we don't mean what a Catholic means. When a Catholic says universal church, he means a mystical body of Catholics all the way around the world that compose the one true church. We don't, we don't believe that. Back in the old days, we had a much better term called the church militant and the church triumphant, which is a much better way to put it. And by the church militant, we meant the body of living Christians who are down here engaged in combat and haven't died and gone home to glory yet. 
and the church triumphant were those members of the body down here that died went on to glory. That's a better way to put it. Now, the first thing about this thing is this. The body of Christ is an organism. The local church is an organization. The body of Christ has only saved people in it. The local church has unsaved people in it. Thirdly, the body of Christ is a mystery. The local church is not a mystery. And if you ever equate them, if you ever make the body of Christ, the bride of Christ, this is his body, Adam and Eve, Ephesians chapter 5, if you ever make that the local church, you've got a real problem. You really get some problems. Because the problem comes in how do you enter the body of Christ? Well, if water baptism puts you in the local church, and the local church is the body of Christ, then water baptism puts you into the body of Christ. And that's exactly what every Roman Catholic this time believes, and every Campbellite. So that's a dangerous thing to teach. I'll tell you another reason why it's dangerous. If you make the local church the bride of Christ, and the local church the Baptist church, did you ever start thinking about the problems of the marriage of the Lamb? Here's the bride, the table, all these Baptists. And here's Martin Luther waiting on the tables. And John Wesley stopping by Harry S. Truman. Harry S. Truman was a Baptist. Member of the local Baptist church. Martin Luther, can I get you anything, sir? <laughs> It'll never work. It'll never work. I mean, I'm a Baptist, but I don't believe that John Wesley is going to wait on Martin Luther King, Jr. I just don't believe that. You can't, you can't tell me, man, that the top lady who wrote Rock of Ages Clef for me is going to be waiting on Jesse Jackson just because Jesse Jackson a Baptist minister. I just don't believe that. Now, I went to Baptist fundamentalism back there in 84 and up uh, stood, I believe he was the president of Pacific Coast Bible College. He was a Texan. You know that guy's name? Johnson. Frank Johnson. Frank Johnson, that's the fellow. He got up and gave that Baptist bride position for 35 minutes. Just as clear as you ever saw. 4,000 people come to Baptist for the Bride of Christ and all the other nominations were in the family of God. That thing, that thing is a heresy that doesn't touch the Scripture at any point. And that's an attempt to make you think that make because of... See, you get a truth, you see. Then you try to make the whole Bible teach that truth. Now, I'll give you the truth. I'm a Baptist, see. Nobody believes it or not. I believe in the Baptist distinctives and I know what they are and I teach them. I teach them the local church is autonomous. No connection with church or any other church or any other state, self-operating. I believe in the eternal security of the believer. I believe the immersion of the adult believer in water. I am merciful. Put them under. I believe all that stuff. But I'm a d big enough dummy to think my church down there, local church, is the bride of Christ. Brother Modish one time, a couple of years back, had somebody approach him about coming to a Springfield Missionary Fellowship or something. He told them he didn't want to go, and they want to know why. And, you know, he's, you know, manifesting everything openly before a man ever been conscious out of God, just so it just bored me to death, can't stand it. <laughs> and then they got on him and they said, well, you're not, you're not Baptistic enough, you're not a real Baptist. And he told that guy, me and Ruckman are the Baptists, and you guys aren't. Amen. Because me and Ruckman, our churches are all by themselves, and we don't, we're not under anybody. That's right. Amen. Now, this church right here, the head of this local church here on this earth down here, is your pastor, Brother Blue. He can have fellowship with anybody he wants to. I mean, fellowship is not membership. Amen. See? You've got to get that thing right. In the body of Christ, you can have fellowship, but I wouldn't take them all as members. I wouldn't do it. You wouldn't join my you would you couldn't join the church I pastor unless you could prove that you were immersed in water after you were saved and that you knew your baptism had nothing to do with your salvation when you were immersed. Amen. And if you had any doubt about it, I'd immerse you again. So I'm out, you know, I'm out of dry as I look. I'm pretty wet. <laughs> but some of the hyper dispensation, they say he's too baptistic, and the Baptists say he's too interdenominational. No, no, I'm Baptist. I'm Baptist. I'm a Bible believing Baptist. Or oh, that thing right there, you can get in that thing. You see, if you don't set up some standards for memberships, pretty soon you got a zoo instead of a flock. I mean, you set that thing up, if you don't have some standards for what you to believe, then the first thing you know, you got some people over here that were sprinkled and thought it was ba uh, baptism. Then some folks who were baptized thought it was salvation. Then some folks think you can lose it. Then some folks, you can't do that. You can't do that. So don't misunderstand me. I believe in membership is one thing. Fellowship is another thing. But the bride of Christ is Christ's body made up of the same people who trusted him. And that's not the local church every time. All right, yes, sir.
All right. Uh, Romans chapter 12, verse 3. And it's a good question. And the answer to that question is that uh, some people have more faith than others. You can develop the faith you've got, but some have more than others. Romans 12, 3. For I say through the grace given to me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, even according as God hath dealt to every man, the measure of faith. Or well, that thing there implies that certain people have more faith than other people. And the passage right there, 4, 5, 6, and 7, 8, and 9, he began to talk about gifts. Now, no doubt in my mind that all of some Christians naturally have more faith than others. There's no doubt in my mind about it all. There's no doubt in my mind that faith can be developed. Romans chapter 10, verse 17, Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. The more you exercise your faith, the more faith you'll get. But I take the past to mean exactly what it says, that some Christians have more faith than others. I'll go further than that. Some Christians have more grace than others. Now, as to whether or not any more is available, the Bible said, Let us come boldly to the throne of grace to obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need, implying the grace is available. But not every man has it. For example, if any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God that gives liberty all. Some of them don't have much wisdom as others. I am certain from watching Christians through the years that some Christians just naturally have more faith than others. I'm certain of it. I've seen it demonstrated. Uh, our personal testimony, uh, I never, never had very much faith. A lot of faith. Never have. That's the reason why I've never launched anything big. I, had never, I, don't, I don't have big concepts. I think little. <laughs> you know what? I think it's from being raised in the Depression. The real Depression. Uh, this stuff they talk about, recession, the oh, kid stuff, man. You ought to come up in 29, man. Oh, brother. I mean, there was nobody had any money, man. You couldn't, 20 cents an hour was tough, big wages, 20 cents an hour. You have a football and play on the football and go flat on you, and you couldn't get it pumped because you had no air pump, you couldn't buy a valve. We'd stuff them full of socks. You have never punted, do you? Punted a football full of socks. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> I see these kids out playing. They're playing little league ball and pony ball, all this little league, pony league stuff. They got to have $40 gloves, you know, and $800 uniform, and all this junk. We played, sometimes we didn't have bases. We used a croaker sack for a bake or somebody's school book. I made a good base. And sometime when we didn't have anything, we'd have a tree. And you have never played baseball. You slid into second base when it was a tree. <laughs> and coming up in 19, I was born in 21. 21. And when I was eight years old, the bottom dropped out. When I was 18, the war broke out. I never got my feet off the ground, man. I never got going. And coming up around to 29, 30, and 31, every morning, mush for breakfast. Mush, mush, oatmeal. I cannot look a bowl of oatmeal in the face, man. I'd rather eat dirt. I'd rather eat the rug. I'd chew on a sheet, man. I just oatmeal every day for breakfast. No toast, no butter, no sausage, no pancakes, no bacon. Mush, mush, mush. Except in Alaska, don't they? Mush. <laughs> I just thought of something I heard the other day about how they handle the kid. They use whale blubber to keep the kid straight in Alaska. When the kid steps out of line, they whale him till he blubbers. I'll be that's way. Oh, we have this mush, 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 mush. And come there, we had nothing. And you know, it's such a shock that you never get over it. Your daddy going down the bank to get out his savings, and no savings there. And I've been saved now for 36 years, and I have never outlived the Depression. I mean, if I think about a big project, having faith to build this big school, this big church, buy all this land, my faith just goes mm, like that. I remember what happened last time. And i tell you something else going to happen again, too. I mean, all this stuff, three trillion, four trillion, you don't go in debt forever. After a while, you hit the bottom and break your skull, man. Why, if some of you cat on your private business like the government cares on it, they have you in jail. Yeah. One day you go to the bank and say, where's my money? And they'll give it back to you and they'll give you back 10 cents on a dollar. Amen. You'll have 100 bucks back in there and they'll give you back 10 bucks. The rest is gone. So my faith has never been very much. And if I had faith like some of the brethren do, I'm sure there are different degrees. I would uh, have a lot bigger work than what I have. Now, I'll tell you a guy who's got faith. It's Jerry Fowell. That bird's got faith. I don't know what his budget is. I got sixteen million a year, something like that. Brother Gray stepped out of faith down there in Jacksonville and borrowed a couple million dollars. I think his interest was a thousand dollars a day there for a while. 
I can't take that step. I haven't got that kind of faith. To me, that's presumption. Amen. And uh, that, just to think about that just makes me, just rattles me. I don't want to go to bed tonight, man, go up the next tomorrow morning knowing I've got a thousand dollars I got to get in as interest before the principal's paid on. I'd have bleeding ulcers, man, all the time. I'm sure some have more faith than others, and I'm sure it's you the dumber saints that have more faith. That's right. Now, I don't mean that. I don't mean. I don't mean that way. I, 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 I don't mean that they don't have any brains. I mean they don't have no education. There's a difference, you know. Uh, if you did, ain't got an education, you just got to use your brains. Uh, I would observe the simple-minded saints usually have more faith than the other ones. I'll tell you why it is. Um. Uh, I got saved, went off to Bob Jones, I hadn't been there a year, but I got a letter from the government that said, if you want to keep your reserve commission, sign this thing and send it back, you keep your reserve commission in the infantry subject to call at any time in case of a national emergency. Or if you don't sign this thing, you lose your commission and your discharge subject to being drafted in case of a national emergency. That was 50. That's the Korean War. Well, I thought I'd been called to preach. I took it to old man Bob Jones. I said, what am I going to do about this? He said, if I sign this thing, call me up, the ministry's gone. I said, if I don't sign it, then I'll lose my commission. I might get drafted back in as a private, lose my commission, go back in a rifle company, start all over again. And i never forget that old man. He, he, while I was talking, he was going, and I, I got to know him after that. He was praying. I said, guy question. He starts praying. I know that because I picked up a habit. You ask me questions sometime, I'll say, would you repeat that? And when I say, would you repeat that, I'm praying for God to get me out of the mess I'm in. <laughs> and so he, he goes like this. He says, well, he said, uh, you afraid to go back in the army? I said, no, I'm not afraid. He said, you know you could witness back there and win the souls to Christ there? I said, yeah, I know I could. He said, well, he said, uh, you could have a ministry there as well as any place else. I said, yeah. And he said, but you'd rather be out? I said, you'd rather be out? He looked at me a minute and he said, don't sign it. Just like that. I've been sweating that thing out for a week. Told that bird, five seconds, don't sign it. I didn't sign it. I lost my commission, got my discharge, emergency didn't come up, and I never saw the army again. Now, you know where that comes from? That comes from a simple mind that sees two alternatives. And that's one of the deadliest things about education there is. Generally speaking, the more education, the less faith. I'll tell you what it is. When a problem comes up, you think, now if I do this, then this will react this way, unless it reacts this way. Of course, I have seen it react this way. The smarter you are, the more you can remember, the more you can get the stuff together. You say, well, if I do this, then that'll happen, unless this happens, and that happens. But if that happens, then this should happen. And if that happens, and the first thing you know, you can't make any decision. So, many, so much stuff clutters up your mind. Oh, who's the button where I am, man? You don't do nothing. Uh, uh, to, to be ignorant is a real blessing. Ignorance is bliss. Yeah, you say, if ignorance is bliss, I'm a blizzard. <laughs> <laughs> I envy some of those folks in Alabama. You know, down the coast where I am, they talk fast, but in, in the black belt, you see a guy who'll say, Well, hello there, Brother Pete. How you doing? Sure is a nice day today, ain't it? Well, why don't you come up and sit down for a while? You sit down. Had a pretty good cotton crop last year. Fish ain't biting too good. <laughs> Every five minutes a thought goes through there, you know. <laughs> and gets out for dies of loneliness. <laughs> And you know, those kind of people can usually stand more trial and tribulation than the educated folks can. Because the mind's simple. The mind just says, well, if I do that, I reckon that'll happen. If I do that, I reckon that'll happen. I don't know which is going to happen. So I might well take one, I'll take that one. <laughs> and do it. So the answer, I'd say the answer to your question is, yeah, God does deal with them a different measure of faith. And it's up to us to increase what faith we have. Yes, sir. Uh, on the lighter side, Judges, uh, Samson uh, catching those uh, 300 foxes there is a pretty good trick, isn't it? Yeah, it is. <laughs> well, look at that. Uh, chapter uh, 15, is it? Yeah. yeah chapter, chapter 15. Yeah. 
chapter 15, verse 4. Judges 15, verse 4. This is Samson getting vengeance because uh, they, they gave his wife to somebody else. Judges 15, verse 4. And Samson went and caught 300 foxes and took firebrands and turned tail to tail and put a firebrand in the midst between two tails. When he had set the brands on fire, he let them go to the standing corn of the Philistines and burn up both the shocks and the standing corn with the vineyards and olives. Pretty good trick, you know. Boy, that'd be the way to burn down the great Northwest, boy. You want to burn down British Columbia and Washington, <laughs> get you a bunch of uh, wolves out there and tie them tail to tail and put a firebrand on the tail and turn them loose. They'd fix things good. The question is, how in the world do you catch 300 foxes and then hook them together and tie, tie a torch on them? And the reason why it looks so impossible is because when you read it, you keep thinking he did it at one time. But there's nothing there that said he did it at one time. But he's trapping two or three foxes a day, or maybe six or seven foxes a day, and keep them in cages till he's ready to go. And then he's taking them out two at a time, or going in the cage with them. Don't worry about Samson taking care of two foxes, he can take care of a lion. <laughs> and going in there and tying those things up and putting that firebrand, let the thing out the cage, go in the cage, get the next one, let it out. It isn't, when you read the thing, you keep thinking of 300 at one time, all them on fire at one time, <laughs> take it off. And it wouldn't be like that, it'd be single. I mean, the pairs going out. Now, if it's, it was at all time, it'd be a tremendous miracle, so I think it's probably the way it is. But uh, you can't throw the whole thing out, because I read over here in the next chapter where old Sam's went out there and lay at midnight and picked up the gate of Gaza and carried that thing to Hebron. And I measured that thing in a map, and that thing is 25 cotton picking miles, man. And that guy is picking up a door. He's picking up a door as and, and a bar as big as the back end of that wall. It's a city gate with the post and the bar and the hinges on it. And got that thing in his back and walks off 25 miles of that thing. So he ain't going to have much trouble with the foxes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, one more. One more. Yes, sir. explain the uh, circumcision of the soul from the flesh and the filling of the Holy Spirit and right. the sealing of the Holy Spirit. All right. Uh, Colossians, uh, Colossians chapter 2, Colossians chapter 2, and uh, Galatians chapter, uh, no, let's see, Colossians 2 and Galatians Three. That don't look right. Colossians two. Oh uh, yeah, four. Colossians uh, Colossians two and Galatians four and Romans seven. Now this has to do with the circumcision of the spirit and the soul, and the relation of the filling of the Holy Spirit to the believer's new life. All right, now, uh, first of all, Galatians chapter 4, verse 19. Galatians four nineteen. My little children, of whom I travail in birth again, two travails, again, until Christ be formed in you. Well, Christ's already in them, but the statement was that he wasn't formed in them. Uh, in Ephesians, a little bit later, he says, Be filled with the Holy Ghost, and you'll see with the Holy Ghost. Now, here's, here's, how, here's, the, here's the misconception of this thing. The, the, the charismatic has it like this. There's the bottle of the flask, and there's the fountain, the water of life, and here comes the water, the Holy Spirit, down in this here bottle, and fill this here bottle up, fill with the Spirit. And then this bottle leaks. And it goes over the top and comes out the bottom, and then you have to get a refill. And this thing here, the Holy Spirit, the top stays open, see. So the Holy Spirit can get in and get out. That's how you lose it. And the Holy Spirit comes again and fills you back up again. Now, that isn't the picture in the Bible. In the Bible, the Holy Spirit comes in. There you go. The lid comes down, and you're sealed the day of redemption. Like that. But he's not formed in you. Now, the way you get that thing formed is you put a little heat under there. 
and put us in the Holy Spirit to fill with the whole vessel. And that's why he said, be filled with the Spirit. So although every Christian has the Holy Spirit in him, not every Christian is filled with the Spirit. Although every Christian has Christ in him, not every Christian has Christ formed in him. And when Christ has formed you and filled with the Spirit, nothing more comes in from outside. Christ said, He that believeth on me, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. It's inside. Now, I don't know how much your experience this thing is. I know you can fake stuff, and folks say the stuff in the flesh. Well, everything in the flesh anyway. Uh, I'm not very demonstrative. I don't, uh, I don't yell at ball games. Uh, get excited. I can't, I get to get excited up to yell at watching anything. Uh, but I, but I don't mind being around people. A lot of noise. They don't bother me. My church sometimes, honest to God, folks, my church sometimes sounds like a Super Bowl. I mean, really. And it isn't the old saints that are shouting. It's the young men and women. And I mean, I've heard that place of noise, and you couldn't hear the choir sing, man. I mean, just, just a roar in your ears, man. You're nothing back in tape. You don't know what you're listening to. And I'm right in the middle of that. And I'm not doing much of it. I just enjoy it. I don't yell or shout very much, but I enjoy being around it. It doesn't embarrass me, you know. Guy go run around the building, come by me, I'll give him, that's, you know, safe going by. <laughs> about the nearest, about the nearest I ever get to cut to getting violent. I, I may have quenched the spirit, see, I mean, I, I may have, we had a couple of girls in our church that sang, they sang duets. And one of them was Jackie Johnson, Melba Jones. And those girls were better than any recording artist I have ever heard anywhere in the world. Really. I never heard anybody record singing like those girls. And they get up there and sing, and there were times when the Spirit got so thick in that building, it was just like a cloud. You couldn't see the back, back room, like looking through a wave or something. And there were several times, I believe, I'm not sure about this, but I think, I think the Lord told me to get up and stand on the piano and yell. <laughs> And I didn't do it, and I think I must agree with the Spirit. It was the funny, funniest thing you ever saw. We had a guy leading singing for us. His name was, uh, oh, what's that bird? Or Pensacola Christian. Get a silence. Get a silence, the guy's name. He leading singing for us. He's over at Pensacola Christian School. He's still there. And he's just a nice kid, you know, just a smooth, tall, slick, quiet, dumbbell, don't know what's going on. No spiritual discernment at all. Nice fellow, you know, gentleman, but just, you know, nothing between the earrings. <laughs> And, uh, and, and he's, and he's leading the singing. And here these girls singing. And boy, the whole building's coming apart. And these guys are whooping and hollering. And get us out and they're sitting there looking at me. And I'm over here on the, on my bench. He's all across from me that way. And I'm getting a blessing, man. See, I'm getting a blessing, you know. I look at, look at get us out and get us out is like this. <laughs> and what he's trying to do is figure out what strange power these singers have. See? I mean, he was studying their technique and their vocal technique, and he couldn't figure out what it was. And he look at them, and they look at me, most helpless look on his face. Just like a lost child in a hurricane, man. And every time he look at me, I just come apart. I just almost, I just almost scream, man. I could laugh hard sometime, almost off the seat up there on the platform. I thought to myself, well, you dumb bunny, don't you know what's going on? It's the Holy Spirit. Amen. But they, but they, do you have no sense of the Holy Spirit at all? Some Christians are like that. You know, some of you like Jacob, surely God was this place and I knew it not. <laughs> I've been up to Harold Henniger many a time when I really was frustrated, boy. I've heard that choir behind me, that 60-voice choir singing only a branch in the vine. And man, I'm telling you, all the benches were, that bench I was sitting on was loose. That thing was floating about a foot off the air, man. And I was just, I kept looking around, waiting to see. Somebody give me some encouragement, man, because <laughs> I'm going to come out of the seat here in a minute. And everybody just sitting there, mm, you know, nice entertainment. Only a branch in the vine, you know, his life close to mine. He's the vine, I'm the branch. Only a branch in the vine. Man, let me just tear you up. But the closer I ever came to violence was about a year ago. We had a guy preaching for us named DeMichael. Uh, Rick, well, he, uh, Rick DeMichael. And he was preaching on the 24 elders casting their crown before the throne. And just, you know, a certain time, the Holy Spirit just gets a hold, sometimes he doesn't. You, you're going to have discernment to tell what's going on. And he got going, and I'm telling you, that church just faded out. And the first thing you know, just like you were up there before the throne, you can almost see it, man. Just see the elders and the angels and the, and the rainbow, and people began to shout and throw songbooks. books. <laughs> 
saw them before the wham, 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 flying missiles. And I, and I was just getting like that, and it was going, man, it was going. But I can't, I, I wanted something to throw, you see. I mean, these, these elders were throwing the crown like that, you know. And it was nothing around, I was, I saw them look too small for me, man. And I saw the band there with the instruments <laughs> and the chairs. And I was out of my seat halfway up there to get me one of those chairs, about the side of that chair, and start slinging chairs up there, boy. And the other thing got to calm down got back off. But that thing got so real, man, you couldn't imagine it. I was preaching up Carl Lackey's one time, and some girl was singing. My, what a, what a contrast with Baptist fundamentalism, 84. Some girl up there with horn-rimmed glasses and dressed down below her knees and old brogan shoes on, about... 30 years old, raised three of her sisters because the mother and daddy wanted to make prostitutes out of them. The older sister took care of them and got them saved and was raising them, that kind of thing. Stand up there singing. So I stand up there singing, singing, oh. Oh, she, I, I think one of my hand goes, oh, oh, somewhere there's a river called Jordan. And they say that it's deep and it's wide. And they say that the prince and the beggar on that shore will stand side by side. Boy, I'm telling that building again to shift away, boy. I saw something. It looked like a roll of barbed wire rolling down the aisle. I mean, I'm visual, so you think that's nuts, but you have to be an artist to understand that. Just like something was rolling down the aisle like that. And I usually can pick it up about two seconds before it breaks. I don't break, but about two seconds before it blows, I, I, I can signal thing when it's coming. And I saw the thing moving like that, and I turned to the fellow sitting next to me on the platform. He's a distinguished looking fellow. He looked like a banker. He was a deacon in that church. Gray suit, white hair, about 60 years old, smiling. And I turned to him and I said, here it comes. <laughs> and that old boy, and that old boy sat there and he went, and about two seconds later, he said, Ooh, I mean, I thought it was a blast off Cape Canaveral, man. That bird went off the floor three feet. Straight up in the air. Funniest thing you ever seen in your life. He looked like a dignified banker. You know, Whoa! <laughs> Heading off. Now, I can't tell you how to know those things. But, but, but buildings have spiritual atmospheres to them. I can walk into a church and tell you by the time I'm in there two minutes what's been going on there. There's an atmosphere. Did you know a funeral parlor has an atmosphere about it? Oh, two miles away to get a girl over here. Okay, um, and now we'll get to, um, where were we? <laughs> uh, oh yeah, about the filling of the Spirit. All right, you get this thing now. Here's the last thing about this. When this thing gets formed up in you like this and you get filled, it puts pressure on the lid, you see? And so many times, you see these guys sitting around, they begin to go, <laughs> and they're going, <laughs> because the steam's built up inside, see, it's going to blow. You watch those guys like Ed Below and Billy Kelly and Mae Jackson, those guys, will sit around and, <laughs> I was preaching with old John Wesley Grant up in North Carolina, and he's down the front row, you know. And I was preaching with him to go, <laughs> West the ground will sit there and right in the middle of your message you say, Jesus, you hear what that man saying about you? You hear what that man saying about you, Jesus? <laughs> <laughs> All right, Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2, verse uh, 10. Colossians 2, 10. You are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. Here we go. In whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands. Of well, the circumcision made with hands, the knife, and you cut yourself. This is one made without hands. What is it? In putting off the body of the sin of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Christ performed this circumcision. Bear with him in baptism, and that ain't water there. When also you are risen with him through the faith and operation of God, not through the pastor's hands. That baptism there, that death, burial, resurrection there, is the operation of God. Notice, please, operation, operation. So when they go to the hospital, you know what they call it? They call it an operation. Why was it? Because it was a knife, circumcised, cut, you see? 
So once in a while the hospitals catch up with the King James Bible, but you have to give them time. <clears throat> and here's a spiritual circumcision with a knife. Now, Paul says this. Paul says, I pray, God, your whole body, soul, and spirit be preserved blameless in the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, faithfully that calls you, who also will do it. All right, there's the body. You understand the body is? You can see it. All right, inside that body, you have a soul. And it's shaped just like that body. Inside that body. Like that. It has a bodily shape. How do you know it has a bodily shape? Because the rich man in hell lift up his what? And said, send Lazarus, dip, the, dip his finger in water and cool my what? See? So you have inside your body another body shaped just like this one. It's a soulish body. It's a spiritual body. That's why a fellow can burn in hell and never burn up. Because the body that burns is not a physical body. Now that body has just begun to be photographed now in electronics. They're getting this green aura and this blue and yellow aura around the fellow. When he gets mad, it glows red. And, but that's old stuff, man. The Tibetan monks over in Tibet, before the time of Christ, they performed a lobotomy with bamboo material, and they call that thing in the middle of the eye, the pineal gland, the third eye. When they got that thing fixed, the fella could see that all around a man. And those old boys knew when the fellow was getting mad by looking at the colored aura coming around him, see. It doesn't, then nothing new under the sun. Oh, I'd see you have a soul thing in there now, for example, you had a hand cut off, see. You might feel a sore hand a couple of years later, your fingers might itch. And the doctor says it's the nerve ending. But that won't do. You've got a hand there you can't see. All right, here's what it is. You see, there's a football. And the inner tube matches the football, but you can't see it. And then you put wind in there, and you've got three footballs. A leather body, a rubber inner tube, and air. And it's one football, body, soul, and spirit. All right, the Holy Spirit comes in, body, soul, and spirit. When he comes in, he circumcises. And what he does is cut the soul loose from the body inside. It's a laser beam operation without puncturing the skin, which they picked up about 15 years ago. But you have to give them time. <laughs> you must remember that scientists are always a thousand years behind the Word of God. You've got to give them time to catch up. I beg your pardon, 2000. The pastor I just read you was written about 68 A.D. So out of place, 1920 years. Pretty slow drag, man. All right, now when you get saved, the Holy Spirit comes in and in one cut, like that, cuts you loose from your body inside. Now, I'll show you how you know that in a minute. You have a bunch of ice cubes here in a tray, and you want to get them out. You break them right there, and to make sure you get them out, you put a little hot water in there. And every one of those cubes comes loose from the tray, and it's still in the tray. But it's not stuck to the tray. Now, you know where Pete Ruckman is? He's still in the body. But he's not in the flesh. He's in Christ. You're not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so be the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now, let me show you how that thing goes. Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, verse 9. You're not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so be the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he's none of his. All right, you're not in the flesh, right? Right? Oh, yes, you are. Come to 2 Corinthians. Yes, you are. 2 Corinthians 10 and 3. That is, you is and you ain't. 2 Corinthians 10 and 3. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. Now, what does that mean? It's going to mean one thing. It means the real man that you inside is joined to Christ. He that has joined the Lord is one spirit, and you're stuck to him. But geographically, you're still located here. So geographically, I'm in the flesh. You want to find me? I'm inside the skin, if you're looking me up. I'm inside here. <laughs> See, geographically, I'm a, but not spiritually. Spiritually, I'm in Christ. Now, how do we know this? Back to Romans 7. Romans 7. Now, this is the illustration. In this illustration here, the soul is likened to the wife. And the flesh, or the body, is likened to the husband. Watch how that thing goes. 7-1. 
Know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law, how the law hath dominion over a man as long as he liveth. For the woman which hath a husband, present tense, not divorced, no divorce there. For the woman which hath a husband, present tense, is bound with the law to her husband as long as he liveth, the fellow she's married to, not the guy she was married to. Folks do have a time with it. But if the husband be dead, she is loosed from the law of her husband. So then if then while her husband liveth, the fellow she's married to right then, she be married to another man, well, she's polygamous, she got two husbands. What happens? She should be called an adulteress. Why? She stepped out on her husband. You couldn't find a bill of divorcement anywhere in that passage. Amen. Nobody got divorced at all. Some have just been pulling your leg. Three, she is free from that law, so she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. Now watch it. Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that ye should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. All right, for your sake, that soul is stuck to that flesh. When you get saved, that is cut loose, that flesh is nailed to the cross. That's the end of it. And that soul is no longer stuck to that flesh, that soul is joined to Jesus Christ. He that has joined the Lord is one spirit. What God hath put together, let not man put asunder. You're joined to Christ. You were joined to your flesh. How do you know that? Old Testament. If a soul touch any unclean thing, if a soul eat any unclean thing, the soul that sinned that shall die, let me escape to the mountain and my soul shall live. You remember all that stuff? That's equating the soul with the physical body. Because in the Old Testament, the soul was stuck to the physical body. That's where that J.W. gets that stuff from. If your body goes in the grave, your soul goes with it. Wrong again, your soul leaves. Now, in your case, you're cut loose. Now, what does that mean? It means you're free. Turn to Romans 8. You're free. We'll make it Romans 6. Did you ever stand up and say, I'm from sin set, you're from sin set, we're all from sin set free, and feel kind of funny singing that? Did you ever watch a bunch of teenagers sing that? I'm from sin set, you're, and they're all getting red in the face, you know, thinking about the sins. You see, if you're singing, I'm from sin set, you're from sin set, we're all from sin set free, are we all sinless? No. Well, then why are you saying free? Christ said, if the Son of Man shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. How are you free? Well, let's see. Romans 6. Now, notice the unsearchable riches of the archaic Elizabethan English. And notice the, the nuggets of the original 1611 text. <laughs> Romans chapter 6. You don't need any Greek or Hebrew at all. Romans chapter 6. Mac Old MacArthur just pulling your leg, boy. Making you think he's smart. How far is he from here? L.A. That's pretty well. We can we can out of bar. We can excuse him not being here. But I've been down to Ray Batum's church down there for ten years. I wonder where Mac was then. Matter of fact, I had a meeting in uh, Pasadena, and one in uh, one in Ventura, and one in uh, up north of Ventura. Um, that real rich town up them rich folks live. Santa Barbara. Santa Barbara. <laughs> Mac don't come around. He ain't going to come around either. Six, watch it. Knowing this, our old man, there's the flesh, is crucified with him, that the body of sin, there it is, that's what you had in Colossians, putting off the body of the sin of the flesh. Remember in Colossians 2? There it is right there. The body of sin might be destroyed, there's the husband, the flesh, that henceforth we should not serve sin. Here we go. For he that is dead is free, 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 freed from sin. Now, if we be dead with Christ, so forth and so on. Now, here's what he said. He said, you're inside that mess, but you're loose from it. You don't have to obey it because you're not stuck to it. You're free to obey Christ because you're stuck to him. In other words, that flesh can no longer dictate to you because the flesh is dead. The old man is buried. The old man is nailed. Now, here's our problem. If you want to sin live a sinless life, I can tell you how to do it. About uh, 15 seconds. I tell you, live a sinless life. Verse 11. Likewise, reckon yourselves indeed to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. That's how to live a sinless life. You say, how? Reckon yourself dead. Do you know those folks out in the cemetery don't have a bit of trouble with sin? 
None of those people, they don't even make mistakes. <laughs> you know why? The dead. Now, here's our problem. When I say our, first person plural, I mean us sons. I mean you and me. Here's the problem. That flesh. Every fellow say his worst enemy is himself. Have you ever heard him say that? That's anybody's worst enemy. If I could get rid of me, I'd have it made. All the trouble I get, I get from me. And I say, you're dead. And the flesh says, I am not. Look at me move around. Did you ever take a shower, look at your nose like that, out of one eye? <laughs> There's that rascal giving me all the trouble right there. I see you. Don't try to hide from me. I see you right there. <laughs> that nose sticking out, that's the bird. That's the trouble. It's the flesh. And I say, this flesh, you're dead. And this flesh says, I want it. I gotta have it. I need it. I want this. I want that. Why don't I get this? Why can't I have that's the flesh. You folks have children, don't you know how children are? I want something to eat. I'm tired. I'm hot. I'm cold. When are we going to bed? When are we going to get up? Why don't we stop here? I gotta go to the bathroom. Jimmy hit me. Why don't I... I want, I want. Don't you ever get tired of yourself? I feel like Paul sometime, old wretched man, who shall live me the body as if I get so tired of that flesh keeps saying, I want, I want, I want, I want. I remember one day I was going down a road to get tried by somebody in some court. I've been caught so much you ought to make me a lawyer or something. I've been hauled up six times. One all six of them, one six out of six, probably lose one of these days. But anyway, I was going to cut the car and head up this court trial and I was worried about what I was going to say. You know, when you go to court, you always plan how you're going to say it, and it never comes out the way you think it's going to come out, so you just waste your time worrying about it anyway. And I'm driving along that car, and I'm worrying about what if this, and what if he says that, and what if... And finally, I just stopped that car and got out in the middle of the highway and just kicked myself around that highway. Literally kicked myself. And I said, I said, I am so tired of you. <laughs> I want this, and I want that, and I want this. I said, look at here, man. You got a car, you got a house, your kids are all saved, you got a place to preach, you're not in the hospital, you're in good health. Shut up! <laughs> I get so tired of that thing. I want, I, 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 shut up, man. And so he tell that flesh, shut up. The flesh says, but I'm alive. Look at me move. You think I'm dead? Just watch this. <laughs> and I said, the Bible says you're dead, so you're dead, dead. And it says, Yo, what are you talking to me for if I'm dead? <laughs> you see, the problem is reckoning dead. When the temptation comes up, if you just say, if you can reckon, I can't do that because a dead man can't do it, you get around it. Amen. But you know how we do. We toy with it. I don't know the sin I ever... I, I better close here. Get running all day in this thing. These charismatics there flip to me. You know, they get prayed and say, Lord, forgive us for our mistakes, you know, all this business. And... And the trouble with them is they read that verse that says, He that is born of God does not commit sin because the seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. So they're afraid to say they sin because, they, you know, if you sin willfully, you lose it. So they say, I didn't sin willfully. You know, I just made a, nah, 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 nah. I know any sin I ever committed. I didn't debate it before I committed it. You watch yourself. You check the old man. I check him real close. You watch that old man get that thing and turn that thing over. And the scripture for it and against it, you know, and back and forth like that. And just there comes a place there that's kind of a vacuum. And that vacuum right there, that will, just steps over and you overrule God. I know why a fellow goes to hell. He goes to hell because he puts God down for himself. No doubt. The sovereignty of God doesn't, that doesn't, the thing that shocks me. I'd expect the sovereignty of God. The thing that shocks me, the sovereignty of man. You know what shocks me? Is how little old puny nothing like you and me can just overrule God. But you do it. Every time you sin, you do it. And the problem there is how to get victory over sin. It's real easy. <laughs> yeah, boy. If you, can just re if you can just reckon yourself dead, that's the problem. If you can do it 60 seconds a minute, 60 hour, minutes an hour, Theoretically, you could live a sinless life. And that's what John Wesley taught. John Wesley taught, if the heart and mind are fixed on God in constant prayer, the first commandment is kept, and the man, to all practical purposes, is sinless. He may have sin in him. We don't deny that. He may be born in sin, but he doesn't commit sin. And I believe that. I believe that. 
The problem is how to apply what I just said. That's the problem. The problem is those 60 seconds a minute. I've seen it go sometimes. I've been able to handle it for, oh, maybe 30 hours at a maximum. But boy, after 30 hours, the, the trades wear out. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Brother Blue, come here. That'll be enough for today. It's 10 minutes to 4. You all been at it from, what time we start? 1.30? Yeah, you've been here long enough now. Two and a half hours.